one will be automatically released by this Friday, I think, or maybe next Friday, I forgot. Yeah, because uh, we need to have one more week for ELS students, and then release it. And, and then we need to release it after that week because they may have extensions on top of the <laughs> extensions. All right, uh, let's start. Uh, so in today's lecture, we are going to learn some advanced algorithms in testing. And we may, you may have heard about these algorithms in our previous lectures, and now we are going to learn them in detail. So uh, this is today's outline. We are going to first try to describe testing as a search or optimization problem, and then we learn two different algorithms. The first one is called adaptive random testing. The second one is called genetic algorithm. So, and actually, genetic algorithm is uh, is quite a general algorithm. It could be applied to different areas, and it's a general optimization problem uh, algorithms. And first, uh, let's have a recap of how do we create test cases. So we have learned that software testing is essentially we try to generate some inputs and execute the input and see what happens. So this is uh, quite simple. However, we do not just try to try any input. Uh, what we want is we, we have some purposes. So we create test cases to try to find faults. So, we, for example, we can use some boundary values which are more likely to trigger faults. And we want to achieve, e even if sometimes we, can't we cannot find faults, we can try to obtain coverage. We can try to achieve better code coverage with our test cases. And we can also try to generate some combination of representative values for example, the combination of different equivalent classes or uh, combinatorial testing we have learned last week. Or even if we, have, if, if we can collect data flow information, we can try to use our test cases to cover def use pairs, and so on. So we have purposes. We do not just r do anything or try to randomly generate any input because the input space is infinite. And so this, these are the things we want. So what does all these have in common? What does all these have in common? The thing is that we have a goal when we create these test cases. So the goal could be finding faults, could be have a better coverage, could be cover, covering some combinations of certain properties. So the thing is, can this goal be measured? So can this goal be measured? If this goal can be measured, then we are searching for a desired test suite. And actually, most of the goals we have seen just now could be measured, right? Like the number of faults, like the coverage percentage. So if if we can think about the thing like this, we can we are actually searching for a desired set of test cases from the infinite sp input space. Uh, we can describe the thing like this: out of the infinite set of inputs, we would like to have a set of inputs that obtain obey certain properties that cover all the statements, branches, or paths, or try maybe. For combinatorial testing, the, the, this test case should be able to try all the two-way pairs of uh, representative values. So th these are the measurable goals converted from the previous ones in the previous slide. So we can try to measure the goal and convert the development of a test suite as a search problem for so we can try to search for a desired test suite. And this is how we can 
consider testing as a searching problem. And we have learned that it's almost impossible to to say that uh, a, a software is free from bugs unless we do a formal verification. And it's impossible to find all faults within a software normally. And but all testing goals just now, what we have seen, could be measured, could be checked. For example, they could be Boolean. Uh, they could be Boolean properties. We can try to say whether a property is satisfied or not. For example, for um, maybe for trying out the two-way combinations, we can say that whether a test suite a test suite can cover all the two-way pairs of combinations or not, right? So this property could be Boolean. And it could also be numeric, because we can try to say that this test suite can cover 80% of the statements, or maybe 19% of the branches. So we can, we can somehow measure the test goals. And if this could be measured with some Boolean value, with some numeric values, then we can try to use computers to help us to verify that or to validate that whether a test suite could achieve a goal or not. So we can try to generate some solutions and try to use, because the goals could be measured, we can use computers to automatically help us to do this check. So this is how we can use computers to automatically do the searching for us. And actually, there are many, many searching-based techniques for automated test generation. And here is a typical workflow for a searching process. So the first one is, it's actually very simple. So we just randomly choose a solution, or randomly generate a solution. And if this solution does not meet our goal, then we try another one. And we keep on trying the new solutions until the goal is achieved, or all the possible solutions have been tried. So this sounds quite simple, right? But, but how do we generate the solution, and how do we select is the key problem here. And because we, we could have many solutions, and the order of selecting which solution to try next affects the efficiency of the searching process. And so we have to ha follow some strategies. We have to use some strategies when we do the search. And this strategy is called a heuristic. It is, it is because, it's called heuristic because it is a uh, it is predefined manually by us, and we don't know whether this will work or not until we try it out and observe the results. So that's why it is called a heuristic. And we use heuristics to choose solutions, and we, we ignore those unviable ones. So this is uh, the keyword heuristic here. And let's think about a heuristic, a strategy we have encountered before, like in assignment two. So in assignment two, feature three, we try to implement a seed prioritization strategy. So can you, do you still remember what is a seed prioritization? Yes. So do you remember it, seed prioritization? So seed prioritization means it is exactly the and uh, the thing we mentioned in our previous the slide. So we, the order of solutions are tried is important for efficiently finding a solution. So we have a queue of seeds. Seed prioritization deals with the problem of which seed to use next. So the question here is, this, is, uh, this plot is actually from uh, Google's FastBench report. So you can see that they are comparing the performance of multiple different father implementations. And, and each of the, and the lines here are 
uh, the the y-axis means uh, the number of edges or branches covered by the fuzzer, and the x-axis is the fuzzing time. So we can see that after some time, after some time, this coverage doesn't increase very much, or it, or it actually stops increasing. And when the fuzzing process is at this stage, it is considered as converged. So normally, after a long time of fuzzing, the, the process will converge. And you may notice that there are some solid lines here. And there are some shadows around this line. And the, the solid line actually is the average value of coverage across multiple runs of fuzzing. Because fuzzing is a random process, it has some randomness. And so if we want to get a reliable result, we have to run it multiple times and get the average value. So this is, our, this is actually how we will evaluate your father as well for assignment two. We will run it five times and calculate the average. And, and the, the shadow means 95% confidence interval. So it's actually a statistical thing. So we can ignore that. And the question here is, does the seed prioritization strategy affect the overall coverage after the fuzzing process converges? Does this strategy affect this? You can make a guess, and let's see what was the result. Yes, <laughs> uh, actually the answer is no. Uh, because the order we try the seed, if, if we, uh, because converging means given enough time, the coverage shouldn't increase that much. Just by changing the order of selecting which seed to try out next actually doesn't affect the final result, right? So what will affect the final coverage are the mutators you can use or the feedbacks you can use. But it is not the order of how you try out the seeds. And actually, there's a difference between efficiency and effectiveness. So this question is actually asking about effectiveness, which means the final coverage the final coverage after converging. And actually, the order of solutions, how we try out the solutions, only affects efficiency, which means that how fast can we converge. So if we can select better seeds, if we can select a better seed at an earlier time, then the fuzzing process can gain a lot of coverage at the start but it doesn't affect how much of coverage it can achieve in the end. So the ordering of how we try out the solutions will only affect efficiency, the speed of reaching convergence, and it doesn't affect effectiveness, the final coverage after convergence. So in your assignment, if you have implemented feature three, you can, you may ex expect that uh, the, the coverage of the father increase a lot at the start, but it doesn't affect the final coverage, maybe after a few hours. So even if you don't Im implement a seed prioritization, you may still get similar results. So this is, this is seed prioritization. This is a heuristic for searching. And we can learn more about heuristics with some um, examples you may, you, you might be more familiar with. So for example, we, when we do searching, we may think about how we can search on a graph or a tree. So heuristics are used, uh, we, we just learned that heuristics are used to choose solutions and to ignore those unviable solutions. And for example, if we try to arrange the nodes of a graph into a hierarchical uh, 
uh, notation. Uh, we can do a BFS. We can search level by level. We can use a Bright's first search to search export the graph. And we can do a DFS as well. We can explore one branch and then try to get back and explore another. So th these are actually uh, some heuristics when we do graph search. And these are naive but easy to understand and to implement. And there is also a searching algorithm called A star search. It actually attempts to estimate the shortest path towards the goal. And the, the term shortest could be used, could be described by the time for reaching the goal or the distance from the goal. And for a star algorithm, I, every time we try to select the next move or the, the, the next action, we are trying to estimate which one will lead us, uh, will, will get us closest to the goal, and then use that move or action. And as you can see here, the 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 key thing for for this A star algorithm is to estimate how can we estimate how close we are towards the goal, right? So we may, in, in some s simple graphs, we can just count the number of edges, the number of nodes to, the, to our goal, towards our goal. Um, but for some more complex scenarios, we may need some domain-specific scoring algorithm to tell us how close are we towards the goal. And this domain-specific scoring function is used to estimate the shortest path and it is defined by us and we don't know how, how well it will work so it is actually a heuristic it is actually a heuristic so this is uh, an example of using heuristics in searching for graphs in searching in graphs and because we are using some kind of heuristics and we are not just doing some, uh, because BFS and DFS will eventually uh, explore all the, we, we it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, they, they don't have these kind of heuristics. So uh, th this is, uh, A star is considered a smart searching algorithm. And similar for, fa for testing, we can also try to use some heuristics to do smart searching. And search-based testing has been there for a long time. And it's, uh, it's quite a mature area of research. And you can see that uh, previously I mentioned that I wanted to make a summon to a competition to uh, but um, this competition is actually from this workshop called SBFT. It has been there for 17 years, and it will be 18 next year. And previously, it, it was called uh, SBST, search-based software testing. And now, because because fuzzing is very popular now, so it's it the, the workshop changed its name into search-based and fast testing. Um, but we can see that search-based testing it has been there for a long time, and it it is a very very mature problem, a uh, very very mature technique. And talking about searching-based testing. So just now we have seen that we can we can convert testing as a searching problem and searching based testing is popular and let's think about how should we do it so ideally ideally we should explore or try out all the possible inputs for a given target but we know that uh, this is almost impossible because most of the programs they have infinite numbers of inputs and we cannot um, we cannot generate uh, uh, the test inputs uh, effectively 
without constraining the problem. And how we can constrain this problem is that we can have a search budget. And this search budget could be the number of attempts we have made or the time allocated to do this search. And so we can actually constrain the problem with a budget. And searching techniques will help us to try to find a solution before the budget expires. So we just know we just noticed that okay we can constrain the searching problem with some we, we can constrain the problem with some searching budget. So we can add some constraints. And normally normally for true and false goals, remember when we talk about the goals, there are some Boolean goals, like whether the test suite can cover all the two way combinations or not, right? These are true or false goals. Uh, it's kind of difficult to solve under a budget. And we may return unknown if satisfying solution is not found within the limited budget. And we learned that you know, in, in combinator testing, we learned the two way we can use the Grady algorithm to get uh, the covering array and to get the test suite. Uh, but we may not be able to finish the Grady algorithm within of uh, a limited number of attempts, and then we may re we may need to return unknown here, or um, we have to, or we have to constrain the problem itself to be to make it solvable. And those measurable goals we can could be used to transform the uh, together with the budget could be used to transform the searching problem into an optimization problem. So optimization problems are mostly described as under whatever constraint get the best we can under that budget. So this is kind of uh, a short description of optimization problem. And here we can we can see that uh, instead of instead of just generating true or false, or maybe um, a global based. So what we can do is this test suite may not be the best test suite we can get overall, but it is the best we can get under the budget, under this constraint. So it is essentially how optimization problems are described. So optimization are like getting the best value within a certain area or within some with some constraints. So this is so we are searching for the best solution possible given the search budget. And this is similar to the concept of local optimal and global optimal. So instead of searching for the global best, we can search for the local best with the constraints we have. So this is uh, how we can think about the testing problem as an optimization problem. We can convert the, t the problem from a searching problem to an optimization problem. And here is how we can describe it. So search for the, so just now we mentioned that we want to search for the best solution possible under some given search budget. So the search heuristic here becomes important. If if we, we use time budget, we need to think about the time to create, to execute, and evaluate a solution. And if we limit the number of attempts, then the strategy to choose solutions is important. So we don't care about how much of how much time do we use to generate a strategy, but we care more about the final decisions we make. And in, in fact, in practice, efficiency in both categories is more desired. And and in our practice, in our assignment, we are actually using a time bound because. Mm, because in reality, we most of the time we we care about time. 
and there are many searching strategies uh, possible here. And let's learn some of them uh, in today's lecture. So now let's come to the second topic, adaptive random search and testing. So when we do a searching, when we s try to solve a searching problem, the most uh, naive approach is to do a random search. So we can randomly formulate a solution here. For unit testing, what we can do is if this if the language is an uh, object-oriented programming language, what we can do is we randomly choose a class in the system, and then we randomly generate a series of method calls, and we generate random numbers of calls. We generate random, uh, we, we, we try to randomly choose these methods of calls. We can also try to randomly generate the method parameters, uh, like the random strings, random integers, etc. And for gray box fuzzing, the default implementation of Minilab is actually a pure, almost a pure random search. So we, we can randomly select the next seed to use. We can randomly assign power, so which means that we can generate random number of new test inputs with the selected seed, and we can randomly mutate the seed. So this is random testing. So the advantages of random testing is actually very, very obvious, right? So it's actually a very popular technique and because it's very fast, and it requires almost no planning at all because we can just take a software and just randomly do something with that software. And it's actually easy to implement because we don't need to implement any advanced algorithms. And it's easy to understand. I hope so. And it's, it's actually, we can just randomly generate anything, right? And, and the most important thing here is all the inputs for random testing are considered equal and there's no designer bias. So sometimes, you know, when we try to build some heuristic-based algorithms, our heuristics may not be valid, may not be true, you know. And, and so that is called designer bias. So we think that, okay, it should work like this, it should work like that. But this may introduce some bias and lead to some bad results. And remember this, this is important. We will cover we will cover designer bias later in today's lecture as well. And you can see that randomness is good. And and designer bias, talking about designer bias for your assignment two feature three, whenever you, although you, you are prioritizing the favored seeds, uh, do not try to starve those non favored ones. So give them some chance to you to be used and mm, to avoid designer bias to avoid designer bias and there are some drawbacks of uh, random testing and actually we have we have a feeling of it before and this is a comic about randomness so here we have a random number generator and this random number generator we just tell 999 it is truly a random, are you sure this is really a random, gen, right? So actually that's the problem of randomness, you can never be sure. So we can never take control and most of the time random testing or random searching lacks both efficiency and effectiveness, which means that we may not be able to converge as fast as we can and we may not be able to achieve a better result after converging. So remember the difference between efficiency and effectiveness. So let's think about some more advanced algorithms to do this kind of random searching. Let's try to add some designs into random searching. So let's consider this input space. It's a very sparse, uh, so the there are actually some tests that could be passed, and there are some bugs that would trigger failures of our tests. 
and you can see that uh, the distribution of the bugs is very sparse. So failures are sparse in the space of all the inputs, but then in some parts of the space where they appear. So you can see multiple bugs are being placed together. If an input causes a failure, a similar input is also li very likely to cause a failure. And in our implementation of the fuzzing tool, actually um, for, the, for the assignment, uh, it you are only required to save the crashing file, to save the input that would trigger the bug. But in AFL, it is more advanced because multiple similar inputs if they are, if you tweak maybe only one bit or two bits of that input, you may still that the other the, the new input may still trigger a crash, and the crash could be the same bug could be caused by the same bug as the previous one. So we are not deduplicating the crashes in our assignment. So you may find a lot a lot of crashes, but they might be due to the same root cause. So, so the thing is, um, so but but for for this example here, you just need to know that okay, if an input causes a failure and the inputs around that input will cause failure as well, and they may they might be due to the same reason. And if we just do random testing because the faults are very sparse, so. We may. It's not very likely that we can find uh, these bugs effectively. And let's try to think about how we can tr make it more smart, smarter. So rather than choosing the, but rather than choosing tests completely r random, we can favor the diverse inputs. We can favor input diversity. So. If a test does not meet a goal, the new test, the next new test we generate should be very different from the previous one we have tried. And this is the basis of adaptive random testing. So the basic idea is if a test case does not meet a goal, let's say finding a bug, covering a new statement, a new branch, or a new path, then the new input we generate should be should look very different because similar inputs are more likely to gen to create similar coverage or similar testing goals. So uh, say that imagine we have a test case here like this. We should uh, sorry. We should avoid when we try to generate the next input. We should avoid this one. And what we should try are these ones. So we should make them very differently. So it is increasing the input diversity is more likely to give us a better testing results. And there's an algorithm for doing this. And this algorithm is called fixed size candidate site algorithm. So it makes use it, it uh, indi as indicated by the name. It makes use of two sets of test cases. So the first set is executed test set. The tests are already executed that did not meet our goal. So we we try to maintain a test a set of test cases we have encountered before. We have tried before, but those are not meeting the goal. Uh, of course, because if once we have met our goal, we should stop, right? And there is a candidate side, which means that there are some random test inputs uh, generated but not used yet. So, so these these are the candidate side. We try to make use of these two sides in our, our algorithm. And first, we try to generate a test randomly and execute that. Test, and then based on that test, we generate, uh, and then we can generate a, a number of n new candidate tests, and then we choose the test furthest away from the executed test, and add 
the previous test and add that test into the executed test set. So this is how we, we can we will loop this we will loop around this uh, until we meet our goal. So this is very simple, right? And you can see you, you may notice that we may generate n candidates each round and we just use one of them. The one that is that looks the most different from the previous one we have tried. But you may wonder, okay, for a single test calculating the furthest is very easy, right? But we have a set of executed test. Given a set of executed test, how can we try to calculate the furthest away test from a set of existing candidate sites? So let's continue. Let's bear that question in mind and continue. So this algorithm, as we just mentioned, each round we are generating a number of candidate sites. So instead of, uh, because normally for random testing, for each of the generated tests, we, we execute that test. But for, for this algorithm here, we are generating more tests than the tests we are e executing. And this is, this is based on this assumption here. Execution is normally more time consuming than generation. So normally executing a target is takes more time than generating a new test. And this is why because because execution in operating systems could be could be involving creation of a new process and maybe handling the error of the previous process. So it could take more time and that's why in American Fuzzy Lab, we try to use a Fox server. So we are trying to skip the overhead of cre uh, process creation using the Fox server, using the Fox mechanism. So normally, execution is taking more time than doing generation because when we try to generate a new test, we are doing everything in the memory, right? We don't. Uh, we we only need file I/O in the last step, but most of the steps are done in the memory, and we don't have to. Uh, it doesn't need to take a lot of time normally. And in theory, this uh, adaptive random testing should uh, should find a solution faster than random testing. And the more tests we generate per run, uh, the faster the goals are attained. And just now, we have a question. We have a question. We we we, we discussed and then the problem of n here, and once we get the candidate side, we need to decide which candidate is the furthest away from our existing uh, executed tests, and assume that we have we have these symbols representing the executed side, the candidate side, and they have some overlapping. Well, they, they have no overlapping. So none of the executed, uh, none of the test cases in the, in the candidate side has been executed before. So what, how can we calculate? How can we calculate the distance to get the next candidate? So we have two methods here. The first one is maxi mean method, which is to which is to calculate. Uh, so which is uh, so given a given a set of executed test test cases and a set of ca candidate test cases, we try to find out for each candidate here, we try to find out the minimum distance away from any test cases in the ex executed test set. So, and we try to find out the uh, the one with the largest minimum distance as our next candidate to use. So this is how we do the maximum method. So basically we try to calculate, maybe for C1 we try to calculate is minimum distance away from the executed site. 
And for C2, we also calculate this minimum distance away from the executed site until up up to Cn. And then we select the one that is that has the largest minimum distance. So this is how we use this method. And the other method is maxi-sum method, which means that um, we try to calculate the distance between C1 and T1, C2, C1, C1, T2, up until Tm. And we sum all the distance together and use that for the uh, f uh, for to uh, to convert that into a score for C1, and then we do a sum for C2 as well, up until Cn, and we try to find out the candidate with the largest sum here, and use that as our next candidate. And you may wonder why don't why don't we use maxi average here? Why don't we use maximum average? It's because average is, is essentially the same as sum here. Because for average, we just try to divide by the total number of I'm right. And for each one of the, if if the set of executed set T is, for, for one round, this I'm won't change. So for everything here, average is essentially the same as sum here. So that's why we don't. We don't need maxi average. We just we can try to we can use either either one of these method to do the candidate selection. And uh, there are many. Uh, there are there could be other options, uh, but. Um, but normally we we use these two. Um, it yeah yeah it's in square yeah, but um, but it won't be too slow in reality, and you can't find a better. It's very hard to find a better way to calculate the distance here, but. I think there might be some more advanced algorithms uh, for calculating the distance, uh, but um, uh, but but I think most of the time, uh, getting the next candidate is not uh, because we don't have that many candidates. Uh, for example, for when you do fuzzing, you may end up keeping like thousands of candidates after 24 hours, and then square of thousands is not a big number, it's like a million, and it's not big for computers. So uh, normally this is not the bottleneck for the performance here, but how do we define the distance, how do we calculate the distance could be the bottleneck here. For example, for when you, if you have tried assignment two, or if you are more familiar with AFL, you, notice, you may notice that there are three speeds. So we can use the coverage, the distance of we can compare two, uh, the coverage of two test inputs and use the distance between the coverage as the distance here. And how can we calculate that distance could be very time consuming because each one of the trace bits could be uh, 65536 of length. And if we compare that one by one by one, then it could be very time consuming. So this distance function is actually most likely the performance bottleneck in practice. So um, actually it's uh, just like what we discussed just now, it's important to choose a reliable function, distance function for your input type. And for, for numeric values, we can use Euclidean distance. So actually this is somehow similar to some concepts in machine learning, the distance calculation. So uh, you may have a cosine distance as well for numeric values. So we have Euclidean distance, which is calculated like this. And uh, this is somehow similar to uh, a physical distance. And for strings, we have a lot of distance uh, measurements. And you can click on this link if you want to have a 
better look at this uh, the, the definition of this distance. Um, but I won't go get into details here because it's really dependent on the target we are using. And uh, let's continue. So uh, apart from apart from what we have learned just now, there are alternative ways of doing this adaptive random testing because for uh, for adaptive just now the the, the 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 previous algorithm it actually didn't avoid the designer bias we are always trying to find the test case the candidate test that is the furthest away from um, our existing ones it's actually it's actually kind of biased <laughs> and and we may end up in generating some uh, we may not we may we may not be able to cover everything equally because because the the hypothesis here is that before testing we don't know which part of the code is buggy although we can use some kind of software complexity measurements to pr do the prediction but uh, we have learned that software complexity does not necessarily correlate with bugs so we have to avoid designer bias and this is a, a more advanced algorithm that could help us to do this so here we 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 introduce a new concept called exclu exclusion zones so which are like the bubbles around the test cases that do not meet our goals so this is as indicated by the name, so no inputs may be chosen from these zones. So if an input falls into this zone, we won't use it. And it doesn't require the input, the next input, next candidate to, to be the furthest away, but it ensures uh, a minimum level of diversity in the random choices. And let's try to see why, why it works like this. So assume that each of the green circle here is um, is a test case and the, the the colored area around this green circle is on is an exclusion zone so initially exclusion zones are set to a user defined size let's say n and our exclusion zones are of the same size and then we shrink the execution zones, the more test cases are executed. So, so, so previously we let's say we the the the, the execution zone could be the gray area, and then it could be the blue area. The more test cases we generate, and so on. And this is also the, the, this execution. The concept of execution zone is often used together with the concept of dynamic partitioning and this th they work together to avoid designer bias and let's see how so we try to break the input space into regions let's assume we are breaking it like this this is uh, how we illustrate this thing and then we generate a random test t for we mean first we need to choose the region first we need to choose a test from the largest unexplored region and let's say assume we are selecting this region here the top left corner here and then we generate a random test t which is a green circle and then we divide the space into two regions so green and not green in this region here and we choose the largest untested region uh, we, we choose we generate a, a test case outside this exclusion zone and then every time we execute a test in this gray area here we shrink the size of the excluded exclusion zone so that we can have more choices that are closer to our executed tests so this exclusion zone is to avoid our newly generated test case to be close to our ex our executed test cases. 
So it's like we are pro protecting the executed test cases. We, we don't allow new test cases to be too close to the existing ones. But since we are the more gen the more test cases we are we are generating, we should shrink the size to allow them to you know because we don't if we generate more test cases and we keep the, a very large exclusion zone, then we may not be able to find a new test case eventually. So we have to shrink the size of the exclusion zone, and it works like this. And this actually helps to e ensure even spread across this entire input space. So we are not starving any. We are not starving any region in the input space. And theoretically, this is better than a fixed size, a candidate site uh, adaptive random testing. So this is, so we should think about avoiding designer bias when we design the strategies. And that's all about the first half of today's lecture. Let's have a 10 minutes break.
Uh, we have to continue anyway. Uh, so let's continue our lecture. So let's talk about genetic algorithm. So let's try to revisit the problem of optimization. So just now we learned that testing could be viewed as an optimization problem. And there could be too many restrictions to in this algorithm in this optimization problem. So in our optimization problem, we are trying to find the best ever solution under these constraints. And there could be too many restrictions and uh, too many constraints. And uh, there's no way to there's no even if we have a lot of um, constraints, it's it actually makes makes the it actually makes the system very complex, so we can hardly deal with it. So what we what we can do here is we can try to sample from the input space, but just now we learned that we we don't do it in a purely random manner, and this is the question is how can we find the best solution given a limited search budget? And this is essentially the optimization question, uh, an optimization problem. And we can apply some optimization algorithms here. And these algorithms are called uh, meta-heuristic search techniques. And uh, you can click on this link again to have a look at uh, meta, the definition of meta heuristic, uh, but uh, let's have a quick look at what is meta heuristic. So, meta heuristic, as indicated by the name, is the heuristic to create heuristics. So, it's like we are not having, uh, we are not having a lot of, uh, because heuristics are defined by humans. And um, and it's based on assumptions. We cannot think about every every possible cases before we try out, right? So we have to come up with some meta heuristics that can help us to generate new strategies or new heuristics. And here is an example. So if we want to generate a, a number, uh, if we use a preset value then it is considered a heuristic because it's manually generated. It's predefined. So we can use a preset value. And then we can move on. We can try to use a random generator with a fixed seed to generate the value here. And then we can further move on. We can use a random generator with the system time as a seed. And then we can further move on we can try to use 
a random generator to generate the seed for a random generator. So what about, so you may think, okay, so this is more like a meta heuristic here. So it's a heuristic for heuristic. So we are trying to develop some meta strategy to generate new strategies. So this is called meta heuristic because I was, uh, this, this term actually confused me before until I see this. <laughs> so it's like, uh, it's like a heuristic for heuristics. So, but you may wonder, okay, what about the, the seed for the first random generator, right? So it has to be, so even if, even if it's a um, heuristic for heuristic, we have to manually define the first, the initial thing, the initial strategy here. So uh, we have to do something manually here. So although it is, we want it to be more automatic or more meta, so we have to do something manually eventually. So just like this example here. So we have to eventually define a seed manually. So this is a meta heuristic uh, problem, uh, search technique. And let's continue. So if we can calculate, if we can calculate a score related to the testing goal, then we can have uh, an optimization target. So that score could be used as the target here. And we can, can, we can describe test generation as an optimization problem like this. So first we can generate a test or a set of test cases. And then we can score each one of them with a fitness function to check whether they are, to give them a score, to assign them a score. And then we can manipulate the solutions or the set of test cases according to a strategy. And this strategy is the meta heuristic strategy we just discussed. And one of the meta heuristic based algorithm is called genetic algorithm. And as indicated by the name, it's actually inspired by some biology concepts. And the, briefly, this is how it works. So over multiple generations, we try to evolve a population and favoring the good solutions and filtering out the bad ones. So. Input diversity is again very important here. So diversity is introduced to the population in each generation by keeping some of the best solutions and randomly generating some population members. So we, adding, we are adding some randomness here and we create offspring the next generation through some mutation and gene crossover. So this is actually sounds like what we are doing for assignment two. So in assignment two, there's one feature called uh, crossover mutation operator. So we will learn why it is important later. So basically, this is how this is this describing how genetics algorithm works. So basically, we are doing uh, we are keeping the best characteristics of the parent of the previous generation to the next generation. So this is the roughly the key idea of genetic algorithm. And here are some key concepts you may encounter in genetic algorithm. So this is a graph from a biology course. And we are not interested in all of the concepts here. And if you are watching the video and you randomly click on on the timeline, you may encounter this graph. You may think this is a biology course, but this is not. So we are only interested in uh, two concepts here. The first one is chromosome, and the second one is gene. So we are not interested in the rest of the concepts here in this picture. And let's, uh, you can bear these two concepts in mind, and let's see, uh, let's go through the the algorithm step by step, and you can try to think about what are these concept 
concepts correspond to correspond to. So first, when we when we do genetic algorithm, first we need to. Uh, so first, individuals in the population. So we have multiple individuals in the population, and they need to come compete for resources and reproduce. And these, those individuals who are successful are calculated as fittest. Th then reproduce to create more offspring than others, and this may seem unfair, but this is algorithm. This is not in our society, so this let's try to do this, and then genes from the fittest parent propagate through the generation. So we are keeping the best characteristics in the best genes in the population, and so that's. The third step, and then the last one is. Therefore, because we are keeping the, we are using the fitness function to filter out some individuals, and we are keeping the best genes from the parent generations. So, the successive generation is more suited for the environment we have defined. So, for the fitness, according to the fitness function. So let's think about what do the chromosomes correspond to here in this algorithm? What do the chromosome correspond to? The chromosomes are actually the the individuals. They are actually the individuals. What does what do the genes correspond to? The characteristics or the properties of the individuals of the individuals. So what do the population correspond to? Population is uh, quite obvious is a collection or the set of chromosomes. So this is uh, how the key concepts are mapped in this algorithm. And let's have a look at the workflow of a typical genetic algorithm. So first, first we need to initialize the population, and normally we do it randomly. So we just randomly generate some a population of individuals, and this algorithm is not. Uh, it, it is uh, actually a general optimization problem. You can use it for any any optimization problems, not just for testing. So, uh, how you initialize the population is actually according mm, accordingly. So, according to the problem you are trying to solve. So, we can do random initialization, and then we do the mating or reproducing in some cases, also called reproducing. And in this step, what we normally do is we try to select select two parents for to combine them together. So you can see that this selection here, we can add some strategies, right? We can you apply some strategies when we do the selection, and then we cross over, which means that we splice we splice the parents. And combine the characteristics of different parents to generate a new individual for the population, and then we may apply some mutation to the newly generated offspring, which means that we can um, introduce more randomness. And then the next step is to do the survival. So this is to calculate the fitness score for each one of the individuals in the population, and then we kill all the individuals with lower scores. So we can define the we can define the level of scores to keep the inputs. So we can use the fitness function to do the survival check. And after that, if 
the stopping criteria criterion is reached, we can stop this algorithm. So every algorithm must have a termination uh, condition here. And for this genetic algorithm, normally we limit uh, the number of generations we have. So maybe let's say after 10 generations of evolution, we will stop this algorithm. So normally it's limited by the number of generations here. So this is how genetic algorithm works. And let's see how it could be used for testing. Actually, for unit testing, there's a, there's a, there, there's a very popular tool called Evil Suite. Uh, this is a screenshot from its website. And here are its main features. So it can automatically generate tests for unit tests for following the J unit format. And it actually uh, has optimization for different coverage criteria, like lines, branches, and even for mutation testing. So do you still remember what is mutation testing? It's different from the mutation we are doing here, right? So mutation testing is to evaluate the quality of a test case, of a test suite. And you can see that this coverage criteria could be used as the fitness function. So test cases that could have higher coverage will be kept in the population, and test cases which has lower coverage will be eliminated. So this is for your suite. And of course, they, are, uh, they can minimize the test by retaining those who are contributing to achieving coverage. And uh, it has uh, the, the ability to generate J unit asserts. And uh, remember, this J unit assert is maps to the concept of test oracles we have learned. So these asserts are actually test oracles. And then they, of course, they run the test in a sandbox to prevent potentially dangerous behaviors. And that's, that's why AFL has a lot of limitations. So it, um, because when we do testing in reality, we, we may not, even if the target is not a malicious software is a normal software but it may behave maliciously uh, by consuming a lot of computing computing resources of the machine or maybe generating a lot of files you know so in, in some cases in some real world programs when you test it in, it may generate some files as a side effect and eventually i once encountered this problem before so because fuzzing you can in fuzzing you can run thousands of executions per second and if if the program can generate a file each ex in each execution then you are generating thousands of files uh, per second and eventually the the system will 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 get crashed because of generating too many files and uh, linux has a, an upper limit of how many files it can handle so it will eventually uh, disrupt, disrupt the entire system. And then, of course, it has a virtual file system and virtual network to, to handle this uh, sandboxing. So this is uh, the concept of evil suite. And for evil suite, each one of the test cases, as you can imagine, the chromosome correspond to a test case, a JUnit test. And the GN could be the methods used in that test, could be the method parameters in that test. So we are eventually returning the good method calls, the good parameters used through this evolution. So this is evil suite. And it, it is actually, it was created in 2010. And by that time, there's a, there's, there are some backstories about this tool because there's another tool called uh, uh, I forgot the name but uh, I think it's Randoop and they, they, they use a different uh, they use a different approach they use model based testing they use model based test case generation and 
the, the, that that's from another research group, but eventually uh, Sweet dominates uh, this area, and so genetic algorithm is proven to be uh, the most effective one in this area, and this was created in 2010, and it is a young technique uh, considered young technique learned in our course because we have encountered many techniques or algorithms that were proposed in like 40 or 60 years ago, right? So this is a relatively young technique, and but it's also proven to be quite mature. And let's consider genetic algorithm in AFL because it sounds very similar to AFL, right? The behavior of AFL. So are there any differences? So actually AFL is not strictly following the, the concept of genetic algorithm. So let's consider this workflow here. Let's consider them one by one. So first for initialization. So the population is actually made up of the seeds, the seed test inputs. So initialization is normally because for 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 genetic algorithm normally it's initialized randomly, but for AFL it's initialized by the user. So the user provides the initial seeds, and in our assignment we are not uh, because it's it's not a technical thing. It's um, uh, is uh, is a practical <laughs> thing, so uh, it's based on experiences. So the quality of the seeds is very important. So you can imagine uh, that um, you can imagine that if a seed is only one byte different from a a seed uh, uh, an input that could cause a crash then that seed would be much easier to find, right? Even if we don't have some advanced algorithms, we can still easily find the crash. So the quality of the initial seed is very, very important in practice, but uh, we won't practice that here, and it's, it's not markable, so we won't practice here. So, but initial seed is important, and it's not given randomly, normally. So we need to collect some good seeds. And the second one is, so when AFL generates the new seed, generates a new test input, it doesn't always do reproduction. So it doesn't always try to combine two existing test cases or two existing seeds together. So it may just apply a mutation to a single parent to generate the, the, uh, the offspring. Uh, but in we, we, we will need to try to do the crossover. And uh, the the rationale of doing crossover is to keep the best of, is to try to find a combination of the best characteristics from the existing population. So that's why we also need to do a crossover. And it's quite important. But AFL doesn't always do crossover. And as for survival, AFL doesn't try to kill the population. So it doesn't drop any seed. It doesn't drop seeds. And whenever if a, whenever a seed can cover a new edge, it will be kept and it, it will be kept in the queue forever. However, um, because when we do the calculation of favored seeds, we are somehow maintaining a prioritization list, a prioritized queue. And it is somehow similar to the concept of calculating the survival population, somehow similar. And as for termination, as for termination, normally for genetic algorithms, we limit the number of generations we can have. But for AFL, normally we just use time for stopping. Because in reality, we uh, uh, our budget most of the time is only limited by time and money. So we use time for stopping in AFL. And that's all for today's lecture. And before I let you go, let's have a quick recap of what we have learned today.
So first we have learned. First we have learned how can we convert testing into a search problem. So we are we we try to achieve some goals when we design or develop our test cases, and uh, this is like searching for a suitable test suite from the infinite input space. So testing could be considered as a searching problem, and then we may we sometimes we have we actually always we always have search budget. We have to limit the time. We have to limit the number of attempts, and with the constraint from the search budget, we can actually convert the problem into an optimization problem. So instead of finding the globally best solution, we can try to find the best solution under the budget. So it may not be the overall best solution we have, but we we need to. Uh, we need to be aligned with the budget, and then we can do. Uh, we can apply different searching and optimization prob uh, algorithms to do testing, because we can convert testing into a search or optimization problem. And the first or the most naive way of doing search is to do random search, right? So to do random search, uh, random search is. Very fast is very easy to do, but it lacks efficiency and effectiveness. And remember the difference between efficiency and effectiveness. And to improve this, what we can do is we try to improve the the diversity of the inputs. So to cover all the common cases, to cover all the rare cases. So what we can do is we can try to always select the the uh, the test cases that are furthest away from our existing or the executed tests. So that's uh, that's the first algorithm, and the second algorithm we learn is because we are if we just try to find the furthest away test cases, we may end up in some designer bias. And we, if we try to avoid this bias, we can try to use zone-based searching strategy. So we can do a dynamic zone partitioning, and we try to cover each one. We try to use exclusion zones to ensure the diversity and try to ensure the fairness. And then we learned those are heuristics based algorithms and for optimization based problems because there are many constraints we have so we have to come up with some um, meta heuristic algorithms and for meta heuristics it is like a heuristic for heuristics so we are trying to come up with some uh, some uh, basic functioning assumptions or heuristics and one of the meta heuristic algorithm for doing optimization is called genetic algorithm. It is actually borrowed from the concept in biology. And in uh, in genetic algorithm, we have a population of chromosomes, and each chromosome is made up of genes. And in testing, this this chromosome could be a unit test case. And the gene could be the methods, the method parameters in that unit test. And for fuzzing, of course, it's very obvious. The seeds are the chromosomes, and the content of the seeds are considered as the genes. And for genetic algorithm, the steps are pretty clear. So first, we need to initialize the population, and then we do reproducing. And for reproducing, we need to do. We need to select parents. We need to. Um, we need to combine them together, and then we need we need to do crossover once we have selected the parents, to combine them together, and then we apply some mutations to the offspring to add more randomness. And after that, after we have generated a batch a batch of new offsprings to the population, we need to check for survival. We can use a fitness function to assign a fitness score of each individual in the population, and then we can try to keep 
the ones with higher scores. And we can continue this process until the stopping criterion is met. And most, um, in most of the cases, we try to limit the number of generations we use for genetic algorithms. And we, we learn about how genetic algorithm could be used for unit testing. And we can use evil suite to do this. And we also learn about how genetic algorithm is reflected in AFL. And uh, there are some minor differences in how AFL uses this genetic algorithm. And that's all for today's lecture. And I will, I will introduce one more algorithm uh, in this Thursday. And I will have a walkthrough of the code of this uh, assignment tool. So yeah, so to, to get you start with. Uh, yeah. Um, Big Ten, I, I, I plan to invite some industry people to uh, give you a, a guest lecture, but I didn't manage to uh, find a suitable one. But I may, I'm still trying. And for, but for the first lecture, I will, I will have a quick um, review of the entire course on the Tuesday's lecture and on Thursday's lecture. If there's no guest lecture, I may I may use it as a session to go through the assignment to the questions asked on the forum. So based on whatever questions you can ask. So if you have questions, better ask before next Thursday so I can use the lecture to go through the questions. Yeah. OK, that's it for today. Thank you for coming. Based off, because uh, like it was one of the quiz questions, or the last one, and I couldn't find it explicitly in the lecture slides, but I assume it's using the program itself to get the property.